Thanks so much for joining us for QI Power Hour this morning. This is Tracy Sharon with the Saskatchewan Health Quality Council. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, QI Power Hour is a free monthly webinar learning series hosted by HQC here in Saskatchewan. And we bring together improvers from a variety of sectors with an interest in improving health and to learn about quality improvement related topics. All of our sessions are recorded and are available on the Health Quality Council website following the event. Feel free to share these recordings with your colleagues who might not have been able to join us today. And also feel free to check out past sessions you might have missed and to watch them over and over again uh, whenever you need a reminder about the topics that we covered. So uh, I am joining you today from Health Quality Council's main office in Saskatoon on Treaty 6 territory. Health Quality Council also has staff that work in Regina on Treaty 4 territory, and we serve the entire province of Saskatchewan, which include, includes traditional lands encompassed by treaties 2, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 10, and is the homeland of the Métis people. As the leader of this organization and as an inhabitant of these treaty lands, I, rec I give my thanks to these lands for sustaining myself, my family, and my community. And I also recognize my responsibilities to work with Indigenous peoples in our province and all peoples of, this, of these wonderful lands in a good way towards mutually respectful and beneficial relationships. So you can visit uh, the HQC website uh, to access past QI Power Hour sessions. Uh, here's a little teaser um, for what that looks like. And while you're on your, our website, uh, we also invite you to sign up for our distribution list, and that will ensure you receive regular invitations to all of our upcoming QI Power Hour sessions. Over the last year, we've been really excited to see the continued growth of QI Power Hour throughout our home province of Saskatchewan. You can see many of, many of the organizations that have joined QI Power Hour on the slides here from across Saskatchewan. Within Canada and also around the world. And we're very thankful that you've taken time out of your day uh, to join us today and for your commitment to learning about quality improvement wherever you may be joining us from today. We are very much looking forward to your engagement and your participation on this webinar today. We encourage you to share your questions and your insights by making use of the chat function. And I'm so happy to see that so many of you have done so already and introduced yourselves and where you're from. Welcome. Um, you can access the chat function if you've never done that before by clicking on the message bubble uh, at the bottom of your screen and that will launch a chat panel on the right hand side of your screen. We encourage you to share your questions, your comments, and your ideas throughout the presentation, uh, as we will have some time for questions and answers at the end that I'll be moderating. So I'll keep an eye on what's popping up in the chat um, so that, that we can uh, pose those questions to our presenters a little later. Um, when you do send your questions, please send them to all participants so that everybody can see them and learn from them. Um, so let's just take a quick minute here now um, to practice that function. So um, we're going to do that by uh, uh, asking a question. So uh, we'd really like to know, um, what's your knowledge or comfort level with quality improvement or QI? Um, so if you can take a look at the scale that's on the right hand side of your screen and let us know in the chat, um, wh what's your level of comfort or knowledge with quality improvement? So, you know, one would be Q what? Um, a number two would be, oh, that QI. A three would be, oh yeah, I kind of know that. Or four is, you know, I live and breathe this every day. So please enter your, your number in the chat now. Excellent. Okay, I'm seeing some twos, some threes, some fours. Great mix. Excellent. So sounds like we've all found the chat and I encourage you to make lots of use of it uh, throughout the presentation today. There are other ways you can engage as well. Uh, so we also invite you to use Twitter to tweet about your insights and reflections during the session. Uh, so you can use the hashtag QI Power Hour and there's a few handles on here as well that you can use for QI Power Hour, HQC Sask and Family Service Saskatoon. All right, so let's get to it. Um, I'm very delighted now uh, to welcome our presenters and guests uh, for today's session. 
Uh, so we're welcoming uh, Carla Flogan, who is an improvement lead at HQC, uh, Glenda Beauchamp, who is also an improvement lead here at Health Quality Council, and we also welcome Ian Shaw. And Ian is joining us from Family Service Saskatoon, and he recently partook in a six-month quality improvement learning program uh, designed for the human services sector uh, here at Health Quality Council. And so without further ado, I invite uh, our presenters to uh, get us started today. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Tracy. So we do have some formal learning objectives for today. Um, officially, we're going to talk about the components for the model for improvement and how it can help us manage change in today's complex systems. Uh, we'll get some insight into the human services field and how that um, model for improvement is implied was applied. Um, and then we're also just going to cover some tools, some tips, tricks, approaches um, to using that model for improvement in your context. So practically what that's going to mean is I'll review a framework and then we'll hand it over to Carla and Ian to share that real life example of that framework in action. Uh, we do encourage you to par participate in the chat. We know many of you have already been active in the chat, so we'd love to see that. And then as Tracy mentioned, we will be holding some time for a Q and A at the end. So now I'll hand it over to Carla. Thank you, Glenda. We're so excited to have you all here today. Um, certainly, quality improvement is something we are very passionate about. Maybe uh, I don't know. I'll give myself at least a four. I think about it a lot in my day to day, and we were so happy uh, with Ian and family service Saskatoon to be able to share our QI passion and we feel like it uh, caught on uh, with you, Ian. Um, so, yeah, just tell folks on the line here a little bit about yourself and um, family service Saskatoon. So we can just sort of understand uh, the context that you're in. Yeah, um, so my name's Ian Shaw and I'm the manager of the youth services at Family Service Saskatoon. Family Service Saskatoon is a nonprofit counseling agency that provides services to families, couples, individuals, and youth. Um, we take a violence and trauma informed perspective when working with families because we understand um, how many people in our community are, uh, are dealing with the, the negative impact of trauma or violence within the family. We have a wide range of programs, which uh, goes from our youth program, youth counseling program, to our domestic violence court program, to our intimate partner violence program, to individual and couple counseling, um, the whole gambit we work with uh, families. Awesome, yeah, you provide uh, an amazing array of services that are much appreciated by the community. So uh, we also want to know uh, where other folks are coming in from. So kind of curious to get the range of folks that we have and what sectors you're currently working in. So I invite you to type that in in the chat as we um, move forward. Really curious to know where folks are coming from. So. Uh, healthcare, no surprise. That's our, you know, original audience, and and so excited to be branching out into uh, areas like uh, the human services. H I see health operations, corporate, HR, higher education, and it's just flying through Lumeca Health, Federal, System Flow, Health Research. Awesome. We have a really nice range, and so uh, I'm really looking forward to Ian hearing more about uh, what what you worked on uh, as you learned QI. Um, and first, we'll just uh, take a little step back and uh, talk about, um, you know, what, what quality improvement means to you uh, after having spent some time uh, in the program and working with some of the tools. Uh, what's your definition uh, or how do you, how do you see um, quality improvement, Ian? Yeah, I always struggle with this because I know you're not allowed to uh define a, a concept using the words that are in the in the concept. Um, but I, I really think of it as like a, a systemic or framework approach to improvement. I think that improvement is something that everyone strives for, whether it's at the individual level or it's at the macro level within an organization. Um, and what quality improvement does it provides you a framework to, you know, help you get started, help you think about it um, in a 
in a more structured way than you may not have uh, beforehand. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. And, um, you know, I feel like no matter how long you've been, uh, you know, interested in and doing quality improvement, I always uh, personally struggle to uh, define it and, and share what it means to me in, in, you know, a concise way. So I appreciate that it's, uh, it's not easy. Um, Glenn, I'm curious to hear what your definition is or your, what it means to you. Yeah, you know, when I, same thing, Ian, this is like thinking back, it's like, how do I define this and what does it mean to me? So I sort of took a step back and thought about what sort of popped out for me is as a value or uh, something that's significant that stood out for me and what, what i took away was learning so i think when i think about quality improvement i think is that it's an opportunity to learn um so i was first introduced to qi when i was working as a clinician as a provider in the healthcare system so um for me it was a it was this novel idea that you know whether you succeeded in the things that you were set out to do or you failed and then it was an opportunity to learn so i think that really just resonates with me that qi is all about learning um, and it was lifelong learners. I think that that was a uh, very uh, strong value for me. Love that, Glenn. And you know we feel the same way on this. So I'm going to turn it over to some of our uh, sort of historical uh, godfathers, almost of of QI. Um, so uh, Deming for for folks that are threes and fours, you'll have heard of him. If if you're more of a one and two, um, he he pretty much wrote the books uh, on a lot of uh, on a lot of the QI stuff. Um, and I feel like this speaks a lot to uh, what you just said, Glenda, you know, his definition is, you know, all anyone asks for is a chance to work with pride um, and just know that you're, you know, the system that you're working in and the processes that are set up for you to work in are set up in a way that allows you to uh, do a good job. That's, you know, and, and do it with pride. Um, and so uh, we also have Don Berwick here, who some might say was, you know, uh, uh, foundational in bringing um, quality to healthcare, uh, his definition is uh, quality is the degree to which the results of the work you do match the needs you intend to meet. Um, and so just a couple other uh, considerations on that. So very curious to hear how others describe quality improvement. Uh, so I invite you uh, now to type in the chat uh, what your uh, definition is or what it means to you, kind of whatever bent you want to take on that. So give folks a moment here to do that. This one will be a little uh, longer to type perhaps. So we'll give it a moment. Asking the question, can we do better and how? Love that. Thanks, Amanda. Increasing the value proposition. Yeah, you know, I was reading an article recently about how it uh, perhaps shouldn't be called quality um, and it should be called value uh, instead. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, way to look at it. And I think a really important one. Thanks, Georgia. Improving to achieve excellence, right? Striving to meet the quality objectives. Ooh, and they're flying in fast and furious. So I invite folks to. Uh, take a look, and I know I'll come back uh, to this as well, because I really love hearing, you know, what quality improvement means means to us. So we will keep moving ahead and, um, you know, 1 of the reasons we brought the concept of what sector you work in and what QI means to you is because. Uh, you know, the evolution of QI is really interesting when you go back uh, in time and really think about how it was developed for uh, sort of a factory environment and very quickly moved into uh, the offices in the factories and, you know, into all the different areas. And then um, came the, the notion that, hey, uh, let's move this into, uh, you know, if this works in HR, in factories, let's move it into healthcare. And I think it's fair to say, Ian, and I'd love you to chime in here, that it's a little bit newer to be bringing quality improvement into the human services field. So love to hear your reflections on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a newer concept within the human services field, especially in the nonprofit world. Um, but once again, the nonprofit uh, sector is looking to enhance its uh, client services and enhance its funding proposals and, you know, run the organizations in a better way. And I think that what one person mentioned in the chat was uh, clients. And I think that's what it really comes down to. Can we do better for our clients? 
how can we do better for our clients? We should always be striving as an organization and individuals to provide better services to our clients and quality improvement gives us a framework in order to do so. Yeah, awesome. And that is uh, the, the, you know, the biggest part of the value proposition is um, making things better for the uh, end user, however you define that um, patient, client, resident, um, customer, et cetera. So, yeah, that's um, it definitely, uh, you know, what I've heard from the folks that we uh, had involved in the collective is that it does fit. You, you, you're changing all the time uh, to try to meet the needs of, of your clients. And uh, this just provides you uh, another tool to be able to do that. Awesome. So, uh, next up, we're going to dive into our uh, main topic of the day, uh, the model for improvement with uh, Glenda. So, you know, we've had a bit of a setup in terms of where people are at and what they think about quality improvement. And so let's start to take a look at this um, model and how uh, we can approach it using it. Awesome. Thanks, Carla. So under Chelsea, if you could, oh yeah, there you go. Thank you. I couldn't steal the ball from Carla. Um, so yeah, so thanks for, I'll get in, thanks for joining us and I'll, I will dive into the model for improvement. So this framework that we're going to talk about uh, or frame our discussion today. Um, so the, the model for improvement is 25 this year. So it's a you know big birthday this year. Um, so, you know, it's, it was developed, developed in 1995 um, by associates and process improvement. And it really has stood uh, the test of time. And, you know, Carl and I were, you know, joking around as we were creating this presentation about, you know, 25 years ago um, was sort of, you know, a high school graduation for both of us in that realm. So, you know, we were thinking back on our, on our facts and choices and whatnot, but um, really, you know, this is, is, it is a model that has uh, stood the test of time. And, and so we're always enthusiastic to uh, share our, our knowledge about it. So this is um, of, of the framework, the model for improvement. It is composed of two parts. The first part being those three questions that you see on the left-hand side, and then the PDSA cycle on the right-hand side. So sort of two parts there. Uh, those first three questions are, what are we trying to accomplish? How do we know that change is an improvement? And what change can we make that will result in improvement? And then that right-hand side is where the tests of change happen. Um, so I'm going to go into these components in a bit more detail on the next few slides. So before I get into the details, um, just to share with you, one of the reasons why um, the model has stood the test of time um, is that it's simple. So it's a simple approach that can be applied by anyone. It's scalable, so it has applications for many types of projects at any scale. Um, you know, it's, it's systematic, so it uh, reduces risk by really sort of um, helping people systematically test changes before implementing on a wider scale. And it's effective. So, you know, we know, especially manufacturing and healthcare, um, there's lots of research to show how effective it's been. And now we're moving into other sectors as well. Or, um, I do have that asterisk beside this, the simple, um, just because, you know, it is, it is a model and it's a framework. So it always looks very linear very neatly packaged um but you know as you work through this it's a bit more iterative in nature um you know it's it's not as um as linear as as the model would maybe show but, you know that first question is really around what are we trying to accomplish and this is getting at having you uh, identify what it is that you're trying to solve so what is what are you trying to do um, and that's done by creating an aim statement um and an aim statement is really just identifying, you know, what it is that you're trying to define and solve. We want to make it time specific and measurable. Um, so setting that clear aim ensures that everyone is pulling in the same direction and the effort is directed at the right problem. Um, it may seem very simple, but this could be often, you know, it's really telling to get um, all of your team members together um, and really start thinking about um, uh, what you're working toward. Um, so, and as an example here, um, you know, if I was wanting to improve my golf game, I'd really wanted to start thinking about what does improve mean? What does better look like? And by when? 
So, I mean, I could define this uh, a few different ways. Um, you know, maybe I want to lose less balls um, over 18 holes. Uh, maybe I want to par more holes, um, you know, over, over a round of 18 holes. Maybe I want to lower my overall score, um, you know, and by when? Is it that next week I want that to happen? Is it next month, next year? So, lots of variables to consider there um, as you're working through this. That second question uh, is, you know, how will you know that change is an improvement? So this is really attaching some measures to um, to that um, to that idea. So without measurement, it's impossible to know whether or not things have improved. Um, and that quali quantitative measure really allows you to determine if that specific change actually leads to an improvement. So if we go back to our golf example here. Um, if I'm wanting to increase uh, the number of holes I par by the end of the month, so I've created my aim statement, I've become a little bit more specific in what do I want to achieve, um, what am I going to measure um, to know if those, any changes I make uh, will be an improvement? You know, and golf is, you know, there's lots of numbers and lots of um, things that happen with golf, and so scoring is kind of an easy one to score. And, um, so, you know, I might just want to keep my scorecards on each round, so that would be something that I'd have as that. Uh, quantitative measure that I can look back on and see if any changes I make will result in an improvement. That third question being, you know, what changes can you make that will result in that improvement? And this is really, it. I think of this as the, as the brainstorming phase. So, um, you know, it's trying to identify all the things that might uh, impact that aim statement. So, what are the things I want to test or try um, that that can be easily tested or readily tested. Um, it really encourages teamwork here. So, you know, the team, if you're working with the team to get together to generate ideas, practical changes that can be tested. Um, and these are officially called change ideas when we talk about quality improvement and the, and the model for improvement. Um, and then it's out of this list of change ideas that you generate that you're gonna carry into the PDSA cycle. Going back to that golf example, um, if I'm wanting to increase the number of holes I par by the end of the month, um, what are some of the, and I'm gonna use my scorecard as my, as my measurement, um, what are some of the things I can test? You know, I can maybe take lessons, I can try a new brand of golf balls, I could try a new set of clubs, maybe it's more practice time at the driving range. So lots of ideas there that you could probably generate um, to test. Um, so, and then from there, it's where you enter into that PDSA cycle. So you'll want to carry over, um, any of those sort of ideas that are, seem like, a, you know, maybe, um, ones that are readily testable, easy to implement. Um, and it really just helps guide your, um, your test of change. So the P, uh, stands for plan, and that's where you articulate what it is that you're going to test. The D is for do, and that's where you're actually carrying out that test of change. The S is for study, so where you examine the results of that test of change. And then act, that's, um, that's where you decide whether or not the changes, um, you're gonna keep that test of change, you're gonna revise it and tweak it and test it again, or maybe you're gonna discard it. Maybe you're gonna decide it wasn't the test that you were hoping for. But this PDSA cycle really just guides this test of change in, in incremental ways um, it involves a small scale and it really just helps you move through um, understanding what you're testing and what the impacts are. So, if I go back to that golf example and I want to increase the number of holes I par by the end of the month, um, and I'm going to use that scorecard as my measure, um, what changes you know, might I want to test? And so, maybe of all those uh, things that I brainstormed, I decided that I'm going to test a new brand of, or different brand of golf balls. So I'm going to plan that, I'm going to test that, I'm maybe going to do a little bit of research as to what I want to buy or test. Um, I'm going to do that, so I'm actually going to just golf with that different, um, different brand twice a week. I'm going to study that by reviewing my scorecards, was there an improvement? And then I'm going to act, is that something, you know, did I see an improvement? Did I get worse at golfing? Um, you know, was it, was it uh, a, a change that I want to keep? Um, and if so, you know, or maybe I want to test something else. So it's really just trying to help you um, articulate um, whether or not you're going to keep that test of change. Um, one of the things um, is important about the PDSA cycle is that um, when you're testing a change, you know, you're really trying to figure out what impact that change idea is having. 
Um, so if I was to test four or five different things at once with my golf game, I wouldn't really be able to tell um, what impact that was having. So, um, or what I was going to attribute the success or failure of that, of that change idea. So that's why we're always looking for these sort of small tests of change, um, things that are easily sort of readily done and um, will uh, we'll show it, if, you know, that you'll be able to evaluate and then monitor and decide if you're going to keep those tests of change. So that is my sort of the, the model or the framework, but now I'm really curious to see um, how this model is put into action by Ian. Um, so I'm gonna hand this over to Carla now again um, for, for that piece. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Yeah, so Ian, I know uh, you were brand new to your job and uh, came into this program on top of learning, you know, a new context to work in and new people to work with. Um, but I'm curious what your, um, you know, learning or experience with quality improvement was prior to joining uh, Family Service Saskatoon. Yeah, um, so once again, I came in uh, to, to the quality improvement process a little late than the rest of the people in the uh, group. Um, and I think that everyone at to some degree is familiar with quality improvement. They just might not use the same words, uh, terminology, or the frameworks. I think that at some point in all our lives, we've either tried to improve, uh, you know, personally, uh, professionally, academically, um, in a wide variety of things. So um, when I first came in, I was a little bit overwhelmed because of how much I had to catch up on. Um, but once I sort of, you know, sat in and started listening, I I knew that I was already familiar with a lot of the stuff. They were, you guys were just using different words and terminology than uh, what I was used to. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, I guess the other thing uh, folks will want to know is uh, what you and your team worked on. What was the project? Yeah, so what we identified is we really wanted to uh, reevaluate how we were measuring client satisfaction. Um, once again, I think that like the majority of people here were really trying to focus on how can we deliver services better to our clients and measuring client satisfaction is incredibly important. So we had a process, but um, what we realized is it wasn't deliberate. It wasn't well thought out. Um, some of the questions we were asking were not relevant. Um, so what we decided to do was uh, completely revamp our uh, client satisfaction survey and the process with how we were administering it. Awesome. Yeah, can't wait to hear more about how you went about that. Uh, one of the tools we shared with folks in the collective was the project form. And just curious how that was useful and maybe not useful uh, for you in the work you were doing. Yeah, I think the project form was useful in the way that it really focused um, our thought process and our goals. I think, uh, once again, I think everyone's seek some degree of quality improvement, but they're not intentional always with it. So setting intentional goals, uh, specific goals to meet. Um, so that's that's one thing that we really used it for. What were we actually trying to accomplish? What was the time frame we were accomplishing it? And how were we going about doing it? Yeah, so one of the things we talked about as we were going through, uh, you know, the different um, materials and tools and, and forms and approaches, uh, we said to folks, you know, just just take what's useful and use that because um, there's no uh, sense going through an exercise if it's not relevant, you know, to, to the work that you're doing. So I'm curious what some of the most helpful tools were from your perspective. Yeah, from my perspective, I really uh, valued the plan, do, study, act cycle. Um, I think that, it is very valuable because it puts into context that quality improvement is a continuous process. It's a cyclical process. You're, you're going through the plan, do, study, act several times. And uh, we went through to, to revamp our client satisfaction survey. We actually went through this the process three times. Um, as well, I think the framework of SMART goals is another thing that resonated with me uh, about being measurable, uh, a systematic approach to it. Um, and then also driver diagrams was also another useful tool that helps us uh, uh, give perspective about thinking about uh, what change you're trying to make. 
Yeah, awesome. And before we get too far, I don't think we've talked about uh, the team aspect that uh, you use to approach this. And I think that's a really important one. So can you tell us a bit about the team and how you work together? Yeah, so uh, what we did is we established a small working group within our organization, uh, our quality improvement uh, group. And what we did is we met on a regular basis in order to make sure that we're getting multiple different perspectives into this. We're also doing it on a continuous process. It's not uh, an open and shut case after one meeting. Um, it, it's an ongoing process within the organization. Uh, so, and it's the first step towards like the people side of change within the organization. You get your small working group together and then you can work on getting the rest of the organization on board with uh, the changes you're looking to make. What were some of the ways that you brought people into what you were doing? Yeah, I think uh, focusing on the people side of change is really important within an organization. Uh, once again, uh, everyone's focused on what they need to accomplish. What are their tasks that they need to do? So they're not always looking forward to, uh, you know, another survey they have to administer to clients or another measuring tool they have to use with clients on top of everything else they're doing. So what we did is we really approached them to get their feedback early on in the process. We sent um, our you know, our first draft of the questionnaire to all our staff to say, like, what kind of feedback? Are there questions in here that you think we should be asking or questions we shouldn't be asking? What about the wording for our questions? Are we uh, using too many uh, technical words or larger words? Should we uh, use simpler language? Especially because we're working with uh, youth as young as um, in their early years, elementary years, all the way to uh, adults in the um, the later stage of their life. So, because um, once again, the the counselors know their clients the best. So we really wanted to get them on board. So we sent it out and then we got their feedback and some of the feedback we were able to, uh, to implement into the survey. Some of the feedback we had discussions about, okay, so how do we ask this question in a different way? And some feedback we decided was not uh, relevant for the client satisfaction survey. Um, and then, we did a small test within our organization. Once again, our organization has uh, several different programs within it. And what we wanted to do is test it within each of them by uh, selecting certain staff just to uh, run a test run with it to get their feedback. And then once again, when we rolled it out uh, agency-wide uh, at the beginning of October, um, we were able to get more feedback from the staff because it was everyone doing it. What's the process like? Were the questions good? How did the client respond? And I love that you were um, using this team and this approach to to tackle really two things at once. It was both about, um, you know, the survey itself, the instrument, which is a huge piece of work, certainly. And I, I believe you tested it with clients early on as well. I can't recall if you mentioned that. Uh, and then the other piece is, you know, how how does a concern that came up was how how can you make it part of people's uh, work day so it doesn't feel extra. Um, so what were some of the ways that you, uh, particularly on the last part, um, help people build it into their workflows? Well, once again, I think that really inviting them in to the process at the very beginning um, really uh, got them on board with it because no longer is it something that uh, a manager is telling you to do. It's some process that you were involved in doing. So we want to get them to want to administer it because once again, uh, client satisfaction is something that we, we are always measuring within our organization, but we weren't always uh, getting the results of those um, measurements out to the staff on a regular basis. So we really want to uh, let them know, okay, this is exactly what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. And here's what the, we're going to do with the results of what we're doing. And Great. that really worked to get them on board. Yeah, and how was that different than uh, the approach you used previously? I know you weren't there, but I think you've heard some of the the, the differences in this approach. Yeah, and I, th I think uh, beforehand, we weren't really intentional with what we were doing. We were just measuring client satisfaction. We weren't really intentional with the questions we're asking, and we weren't really intentional uh, with using the results of what we were doing. So we got a bunch of surveys back with client satisfaction. What did we do? We didn't have any process for that. Now, after doing the, the quality improvement, thing, we do have a process for how we're going to use those results. 
Awesome. I, sh I see we have a PDSA cycle uh, resource shared. Love having a uh, good read. So thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, so I definitely hear that, you know, some of the things that really worked for you all uh, were the team approach, um, taking the time on a weekly basis to dedicate towards this, uh, really deciding what it was you wanted to work on and, and um, you know, what, what all the things uh, were that, you know, really zeroing in on identifying the problems with the current way that you were doing things. So all really great, uh, great approaches and um, love hearing how that uh, seems to have resonated with staff and, and got them on board. Uh, so I think now uh, in a few minutes here, we'll um, uh, start to move over to uh, Glenda for some wrapping thoughts, because I feel like we've covered a lot of ground already and would love to hear uh, what questions we have uh, from folks as well. Um, but just before we move over to uh, Glenda, just curious, Ian, you know, what, what next steps are uh, for, for you and your organization on your QI journey? So our next steps is to really, you know, put the uh, client satisfaction um, process into place. Um, so once again, we we did our test run in the summer. Uh, we evaluated the results. We ran our first uh, agency wide run in October, uh, and we did our client satisfaction week so that we get a cross section of. Uh, a variety of different clients and uh, at a variety of different stages in their in their uh, healing journey. So our next uh, step is to you know evaluate the results, and then we're also going to do another client satisfaction week at, in December, so that we're constantly getting more data. Um, because once again, uh, surveys you know the return rate isn't always the best. You're not going to get 100% return rate. So the more frequently we do it, and we're going to do it on a two to three month uh, interval. Um, allows you to start collecting more and more data so you can sort of identify, okay, where can we actually focus on our client uh, satisfaction improvement? Yeah, awesome. That idea of data over time was something we talked a lot about in the collective. And so really happy to hear that you're moving from a kind of once annual uh, approach to this into a more regular rhythm so that you can have that ongoing information to inform, you know, where you want to make the changes. So. Awesome. I am going to hand it over to Glenda. I feel like we've covered a lot of ground and over to you. Awesome. Thanks. And I just, you know, I love the chat uh, happening as Ian was speaking as well. So lots of great comments and thoughts in the chat. Um, so by way of summary here, um, we'll just share a few of those, what those tools that Ian talked about look like. Um, and just to note that all of the resources from today's session um, including the recording and slide deck will be posted on our HQC site following the session. So uh, we won't share out any links to the to these resources themselves in this uh, in this WebEx, but you can definitely find them on our on our website after the fact. So one of the tools that Ian talked about was uh, the project form, and so you know this is a tool that he found helpful with his group, but it really just articulates um, you know sorting out those slots and getting them down onto paper. Uh, what, you know, why are you working on this problem? Uh, you know, what is the current state? Where do things stand? Um, you know, how do you want things to be better? You know, what's the desired outcome there? Um, getting to some root cause analysis. So, you know, what is the root of your problem and why do you have this problem? You know, and the action planning. So, you know, where to from here? What are the things that are going to get carried out and tested? And probably importantly is who's going to be doing those. So attaching uh, not just the action item, but someone to be responsible for that action item. So that's a, it's, it can be a very helpful tool to help you um, just sort of think through your problem. Smart goals was one other uh, tool that Ian said resonated with him. Um, so smart goals stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time-based. So it's really just a framework to help you sort through, you know, what you want to achieve and by when, and again, attaching something measurable, um, attaching a time frame to that. So, um, you know, just to say you want something to be better, Eventually, you know, this is sort of that idea of like, so what do you want to be better and by when? How are you gonna um, how are you gonna measure that and what are you gonna do to work toward that? Uh, another framework for questions that we often have used, um, very similar in um, in concept, is fast goals. Uh, so fast is frequently discussed, ambitious, specific, transparent. 
Um, so a bit of a different take, but again, really just trying to get you to uh, think through your goal setting and, and what you want to achieve. The PDS, PDSA works, worksheet. So, and I did see some great chat about this. Great to document your, the things that you're testing. Um, you know, we don't want to rely on our memories for what we're testing, um, how things worked out. So, this is an example of a worksheet that can be helpful to really help you articulate um, what you're working on. And the results and whether or not you plan to keep or discard that test of change that you tried. So we are going to head into um, the Q&A part now. So we do have a bit of time for that. But Ian, I'm just going to ask you to, um, as the audience is getting set to, you know, asking their good questions. Um, just thinking back to your your time with the collective and working on this project. Um, do you have one sort of standout moment or one big celebration um, that you that really stands out for you? Honestly, I think that the, the, the thing I celebrate the most is just getting the uh, consistent quality improvement process started in our organization. I think that like, uh, like every large task, uh, it, the effort is getting the ball rolling. Once it starts rolling, then it's easier. But that initial push to get things uh, handled, to get people on board is, is the challenging part. So. Being able to get the, the process started in our organization uh, is probably the, the thing that I celebrate the most. I love it. Yeah, it's no no easy task, I'm sure, but um, definitely worth celebrating. So thanks for sharing that. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Tracy. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for, for sharing the presentation and the reflections. Um, so we've mentioned we will have time for some questions. Um, so I'll, I'll give folks a minute to start uh, putting those um, into the chat. Uh, I haven't seen any pop up yet. Oh, I did see a, a comment here. So, oh, here's a question. So I think the biggest must have, oh, sorry, it moved. I just, another one. I have to scroll backwards. So I think the biggest must have in any quality improvement work is a learning mindset. Any tips for how you encourage that mindset? How do you help people understand that doing your job and improving your job are both equally important? I think that, um, I think that deep down, everyone wants to improve in what they do. I just think that people don't feel that they have the time uh, to do it because they're more caught up with, I have to do A, B, C, and D every single day, and I don't have time for X, Y, and Z. But I think deep down, everyone wants to do it. And I think by creating a process within your organization that enables people to do it, um, also provides them with a framework to do it, um, is very important. Thanks so much, Ian. Um, so I think I, I heard in your response, um, number one is to start and number two is to build a process to make it, to make it easier and to, and to build it into your work. Um, but the most important thing is to start and to start somewhere. Uh, okay, I'll go on to the next uh, question that's popped up here. Thank you so much for putting those in. I'll try to get to them all. Uh, so this is a question for Carla or Glenda. How do you find the use or uptake of the, the fillable worksheet for the plan do study act cycles. Um, so they come at this is one of the challenges I see with everyone so busy. It's hard to get folks to document and build on the learning and create a coherent story and engagement in the quality improvement. I can start Glenda. Um, yeah, I, I do, uh, you know, we definitely heard particularly in the collective that, um, Writing things down was, uh, you know, felt like something really extra for people to add into their day. Um, and so, you know, I think for me, uh, if it's the difference between people using a QI mindset to approach uh, the way they're doing things, uh, and if a barrier is filling out a form, then you know what, I, I think I will say, you know, the form can come later or, um, you know, help, I can help you write the form or um, some of those things. Um, I wouldn't want to make it a, a barrier, um, even though yeah, I totally agree. It can be such a great uh, way to have people tell the story. So I don't know, Glenda, if you have something different to share on how you um, 
facilitate the process and, and Ian, if you want to weigh in as well, I think you'd have some good insights. Yeah, you know, I think the only thing I would add is it's not for me. It's not so much about the tool. Um, cause I mean, there's so many tools that people can use to sort of support the work they're doing. Um, for me, it's more about what, what works for you to keep track of what you did. And, you know, there's, if there's a better way to do that for, for uh, the work that you're doing. Um, but yeah, so I wouldn't, I'm not so much hung up on the form itself. Um, but, you know, sort of recording somewhere what you've done. Um, and I, I relate this to my bread baking, you know, like, so I, I do sourdough and every time I make it, it's a whole, um, different experience, uh, depending on temperature and all those sorts of things. And if, if I don't write the things down. You know, I don't know what I did. I'm like, oh, I'll remember. Uh, actually, I probably won't. So for me, it's more about just sort of capturing um, what happened in some in some fashion. And I think it comes down to uh, not what you need to do, but what can you do. I think that uh, it's it's very important, uh, especially coming from um, a counseling background. It's it's not about what do I need to accomplish with the client. It's like what can I accomplish with. Today. So I think it's the same sort of process. Great advice. Thank you so much. Uh, so the next question, I'm seeing lots pop up here, so this is great. Um, the next question uh, is, how do you include qualitative assessment in the Plan Do Study Act cycle, Keep in, keeping in mind that not everything that counts can be counted? Yeah, that's, that's actually... Uh, really interesting. I think qualitative, when you're measuring, from my perspective, when you're measuring client satisfaction, you're only going to get so much uh, with uh, quantitative data. And that that actually leads to how we're expanding our quality improvement uh, initiative with an organization. We are going to uh, implement some qualitative uh, focus groups with clients where we can ask questions, get responses, and, and how we're going to set those uh, those groups up is we're just going to follow the exact same process we did when establishing our um, our client satisfaction survey. So, um, what we want to do, when do we want to do it by, uh, and go through the plan, do study act cycle multiple times until we're ready to actually start facilitating them. Thanks so much. Really great, great example. And and one of the things I think. Um, that is great about quality improvement is that um, there are lots of different types of data and we take all kinds. Um, and so um, there are lots of different ways um, we can know how things are working or not. And um, that's, that's one of them for sure. So the next question, uh, let me just make sure I've got the right one here. Is there a limit to how much improvement you can make in an organization? Oh, I, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Is there a limit in how much improvement you can make? Um, you know, I, I really think that, um, I, I don't always get caught up in, in huge improvements. I really get focused on what small improvements can we make? Because I think a lot of small changes can lead to big changes. Um, and that's also how I really approach uh, counseling as well with clients. Um, so. I don't think there is a limit. I think that, you know, there's always room for these small little improvements. And I think people don't need to get caught up on, like, I need to do this improvement that will change the entire face of the organization. Maybe it's just something really small. And when you add these small little improvements up, that's where you get your big change. Thanks so much, Ian. Yeah, I, I think that's a theme as well as let's, um, uh, let's focus on small tests of change and, and small changes that we can do that that lead to big change. Um, and I think my my reflection would be, um, you know, if, if if we have a mindset of continuous improvement, uh, we never really get there. We're always there's always something we can be better at, always something we can improve on. Um, and so it's it's a bit of a mindset of, as well of of um, continually updating your destination um, so you can continue improving. Uh, the next one here is more of a comment, but I'll, I'll put it out there to see if, if any of our panelists want to want to comment further. Um, so it's about uh, sustaining engagement by um, talking about how the improvement will benefit everyone involved and that team engagement is critical to the success of an improvement project. Um, and I think, Ian, you talked a, a little bit uh, about this in, in your reflections on your work uh, on your improvement projects, but just want to put that out there in case there's anything else uh, you'd like to say or, or Carla or Glenda as well. 
Yeah, I think that the people side of change is, is essential, right? It doesn't matter if I can spend uh, entire weeks working on surveys and quality improvement within an organization, but if the staff aren't on board with administering them or implementing these changes, it's, it's kind of wasted. So I think what you have to do is you really have to get people um, involved as a stakeholder early on, get their feedback, get their thoughts. I think, you know, the easiest thing you can do uh, to get people on board is to say, what do you think about this? Just ask them a very simple question to get their opinion or the thoughts or feelings. That way they'll feel more engaged. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm seeing several comments um, about uh, change fatigue um, and in particular um, how several folks are, are feeling that uh, in our current environment. Um, but that was, you know, one thing I was wondering about. So when you, when you talked earlier about the model for improvement, we've seen several commenters in the chat say this as well as it seems kind of de deceptively simple, um, but can be quite complex and challenging. Um, so do you want to share anything about, you know, some of the challenges or, or, or pitfalls that teams can come up against and, and how, how teams can work through those challenges? Yeah, I think uh, change fatigue is a big thing. Uh, once again, this was this was just one of the changes that was going on in organization after uh, changing our our entire structure for how we're going to deliver services during during the COVID period that we're doing. So, change fatigue is is a real thing. And uh, once again, the, the quality improvement does seem simple, but it is a lot of work, especially to get that ball rolling. Um, so. Once again, I think that it's just so important to listen to your staff, listen, get their feedback, um, see that you can understand them. We had a ton of, we had a, not a ton, but we had several members of our staff saying like, this is too much work. I already have to do this evaluation at the end of session. I have to do this evaluation at the end of session. I don't want to do a third one. And what we just, what I just did is I just said, well, I, I hear your concerns. Let me tell you why it's important for us to do this. Because if we're not measuring this at some point, uh, we're not measuring it at all. And we all want to strive to do better. You want to do better as a clinician. We want to do better as an organization. So really um, communicated, communicating and listening is, is incredibly important. And once again, change is, change is uh, something that's unavoidable. And unfortunately, at certain points in your professional career or at certain points in your organization, there you will go undergo a, a period of, of rapid change. And I think that uh, you just need to listen to people, listen to the concerns um, and get their, their perspective on it. I think that's incredibly important. Thank you, Ian. Uh, any other thoughts to add? Okay, uh, I think we've got time for maybe one more question and I, I have um, checked the Q&A box as well. And so I've seen one pop up in there. And so maybe we'll make this one our last one. Um, so the question says, what are some ideas for engagement with COVID stress on the GEMBA? And for those who might not be familiar with the terminology, uh, GEMBA is a term that comes from um, lean management principles that uh, really refers to the place where the work is done. Um, so the GEMBA would be, you know, the place where care is provided um, in the context of COVID. It could be the place where, um, you know, vaccinations are given or, or, or um, on the ICU, something like that. Um, so, so what are, and I, I'm assuming by, by COVID stress, maybe you, you might be thinking a bit about the constant change or the constant kind of cycles in, of improvement. I'm going to do some interpretation there, um, but, but any, any tips, I guess, maybe for or, um, you know, working through improvement in a, in a high stress environment. Um, so what I think is just, you know, focus on small change, focus on uh, small steps. I don't think once again, you need to take these large steps um, every single time you want to do an improvement. I think, you know, sometimes focus on what's the easiest improvement we can focus on right now. Um, because yeah, this, stress in the workplace due to COVID, due to uh, changes is, is something you have to deal with. And um, everyone knows that when, you're, when your staff is stressed, uh, performance goes down. Um, services aren't delivered the way that they need to be delivered. So, um, you know, keep in mind that uh, staff are just people and 
they they have their own struggles. They have their professional struggles. They have their personal struggles. Um, so really being conscious about what can I ask them to do today? Not what do I need them to do today? What can I ask them to do today? So um, small steps is, is what uh, my, my answer would be. Thanks so much, Ian. Yeah, what I really, I, I heard you say there is, um, you know, keep it, keep it specific, keep it small, uh, keep it simple, um, and keep it linked to, you know, why, why folks are there uh, to, to making care or services better for patients or clients or families or whoever it is you're serving, uh, but keep it linked to those, um, and that's a way to move forward. Excellent. Well, I want to thank uh, all three of you so much for sharing uh, the presentation and the information and the insights um, today. And um, I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, just wrapping up here and uh, preparing us for uh, our next session of QI Power Hour. Uh, so if I'm able to move this forward. Uh, one of the ways that we show gratitude to our speakers and presenters on QI Power Hour, so Ian, you can you can expect to see a pair of these beauties coming your way, um, is with a the highly coveted speaker gift of I Love Quality Improvement or I Heart QI socks. Um, so if you also would like to get your hands on a pair of these, uh, we invite any of you listening today and, and any, of, any folks you think would be great to become a QI Power Hour speaker. Um, if you have a topic that you think our community of learners would be interested in, we'd really love to hear from you. Um, and there will be a link uh, that will be shared in the chat that you can uh, use to, to share your idea for a topic. So thank you so much uh, to, to all three of you for your presentation today. At Health Quality Council, uh, we are also interested in continuous quality improvement. Um, so in that spirit, we'll be, we will be sending out a survey after the webinar is over. Uh, so when you go to leave, uh, you may see uh, the message that's on the screen pop up, a bit of a warning about an external site. Uh, never fear, uh, it is taking you to the evaluation survey and we'd really like it if you could take a few minutes to fill that out, please, so that we can use your feedback uh, to make our, our future presentations uh, better and continuously improve. And so I want to put in a, a bit of an ad uh, for our next session on November 26th on Data for Good with Kevin Hayes as a presenter. Uh, to register, um, you can visit our website uh, and you can also join our distribution list. Uh, so Data for Good is a national nonprofit organization uh, comprised of volunteers uh, that has chapters across the country that help other not-for-profit and non-governmental organizations harness the power of their data to make more informed and better decisions in their quest to make their communities flourish. Uh, so there will be a link shared in the chat that you can use to register for that session. And we look forward to seeing you there. And I think would be a great, um, great continuation of a conversation we started today about quality improvement and the model for improvement, and then learn a bit more about how we can use data for improvement. So again, I want to thank our presenters uh, today, Carla, Ian, and Glenda. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your insights and your information with us. And I wanna thank all of you uh, who've joined our, our session today. And I uh, want to remind everyone, uh, if you haven't had a chance uh, to get vaccinated for COVID or influenza, please take your earliest opportunity to do that and protect yourself and your community and keep each other safe. And until next time, uh, everybody take care and stay safe. Thanks everyone.